Hello, and welcome to the Boston University Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation webcast. Thank you for joining us. I am Sally Rogers, Director of Research at the Center, and it is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you our distinguished presenter today, Dr. William Anthony. Dr. Anthony will be speaking with you today about principled leadership in public mental health. Who better to discuss with us the topic of leadership than Dr. Anthony? He is currently Executive Director of the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation, which he founded in 1979, and also Professor at Sargent College at Boston University. Over the past 35 years, Dr. Anthony has offered, authored over 100 professional articles, numerous textbooks and book chapters, and a host of other materials for the mental health and rehabilitation fields. He has been in demand both nationally and internationally as a speaker who can address cutting edge issues of concern to us in the mental health field. Dr. Anthony has also been the recipient of numerous awards for leadership, including the President's Distinguished Service Award. Most relevant to his talk today, Dr. Anthony has observed incredible changes in the mental health field over the past several years and has also been a driver of those changes. He is a leader in mental health and rehabilitation and has advocated for transformation to a recovery-oriented mental health system in a, time where many, in a time when many were skeptical of that change. It is through that lens of our evolving field and the need for innovation and change that Dr. Anthony will speak with you today about principled leadership in public mental health. Dr. Anthony? Okay, thank you, Sally. And I first want to welcome everybody here in the room, welcome the folks, folks that are listening on the uh, webcast live and also the folks that will be listening at some later date. Welcome. I want to preface my talk on uh, principal leadership with a few, few personal comments, I guess, or, or some comments that, that allowed me to get to this place. What do I mean by principled leadership? Well, to me, what that means is those are the basic principles and tasks that guide effective leaders' actions. That's what I mean by principled leadership. We'll be talking about principles. Focus is on the basic question of how do, what guided leaders in creating, in maintaining, in building their particular organization. All right, the focus is not on uh, things like what is the leader's system or program or or unit and a big description of that. We're not going to describe that except to put it in the context of where the leader is working and so forth. But it's not going to be a description of a lot of programs or, or what, what programs the leader has created. Uh, we're also not going to focus on what are the characteristics of the leader. All right, well, are they warm, are they cold, are they what's their Myers-Briggs or whatever. We're going to talk about principles that guide the leader. So that's one thing when, we, when I use the term principled leadership. The second thing is, when I use the word principled leadership, I mean, I mean that it's principled because the, the, the leader is developing a program or a unit or whatever that's designed to help people recover. All right, recovery is the vision, it's kind of the basic truth that guides these leaders that I'm gonna talk about, their, their actions. All right, so it's principled in that sense as well. Um, I'm not going to go into the research that shows recovery is uh, happening. Uh, I think that's uh, Harding's analysis of the research and so forth uh, stands the test of time. People are, in fact, recovering. All right, the President's New Freedom Commission says, uh, uh, well, what's recovery? And I'll quote here, to enable adults with serious mental illnesses and children with serious emotional disturbances to live, work, learn, and participate fully in their communities. We're talking about leaders who are, who are principal and they're trying to develop that vision within their organization. Or as I've defined uh, recovery, they're trying to help people develop new meaning and purpose in their life as they grow beyond the catastrophe of severe mental illnesses. All right, so principal leaders are working towards recovery and we're gonna talk about the principles that guide them. 
Now, uh, also in terms of a preface, what's my interest in this? Uh, well, back in the, I think it was the early, early 90s, I wrote an article called The Decade of Recovery. And I was referring to the fact that we should be emphasizing recovery as much as we're emphasizing, at that time, the decade of the brain. And I, was, I questioned when I, when I wrote that, and I thought about various organizations, I had a couple questions in, on my, uh, in my head at that time, and they were these. Why do some service organizations pursue this vision of recovery with diligence, while others seemed unaware of the fact that their own people were recovering? Or why do some organizations flourish while others seem to calcify? Or said another way, why do some organizations have direction and energy to transform their services and some organizations don't seem to have a clue? All right. The answer in part for me to, that, to that, uh, those series of questions was leadership. And I had a chance uh, to go around the country and, and observe many leaders, talk to many leaders, et cetera, and it occurred to me over and over again that that the leadership was making a difference in terms of why some organizations were th uh, flourishing and why some weren't. So in 1993, I wrote an article called uh, Programs at Work, Issues of Leadership. And that kind of started me down this track of, of looking at leadership. That's quite some time ago. Uh, and since that time, I've been interviewing dozens of leaders around the country and taping their interviews. Uh, leaders who are trying to transform their particular organizations. I've been visiting, continue to visit and observe, observe these organizations that are run by leaders who are trying to transform their services. And also I've been studying the literature in the for-profit sector uh, of, of how leaders are, are acting in the, in the for-profit sector. And it's based on those activities that I'm giving this particular talk today. Uh, and out of which uh, came the eight principles of leadership that I'll, and the accompanying tasks that I'll be focusing on. So I also want to start with some background issues, all right, just that I want to cover before we get into the uh, leadership principles. First of all, what do we mean by transform, transformational leadership, which is a term you hear more and more now that combine the whole idea of transforming organizations into uh, an adjective, transformational leadership. Uh, well, by transformation, I mean what SAMHSA means. Uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration has, has uh, focused a lot on transformation and what is transformation. And really, it's drastic change. Uh, I'll quote uh, from their leaders, uh, Curry and Power, and they say, transformation implies profound change, not at the margins of the system, but at its very core. In transformation, New sources of power emerge. New competencies develop. We look for what we can do now that we couldn't do before. All right, so you can see it's a drastic, profound change. We're not just talking about implementing a little program or a new form or a new test in your organization. We're talking about transforming the organization entirely. And, and why do we have to do this? You know, why, why is the need so, so immense at this particular point in time? Well, if you reflect back on the, on the last century, for the most part, until the very end of the last century, no one was talking about recovery. There was no recovery vision. Uh, I often quote the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical, Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. Up until 1987, it said schizophrenia uh, was characterized by acute exacerbations, and this is a quote, acute exacerbations with increasing deterioration between episodes. So we had developed a system that really believed that anybody with a severe mental illness was going to deteriorate over time. So our vision, of course, at that time was to stave off the deterioration and maybe to reduce the symptoms. But it certainly wasn't about helping people live, learn, work, participate fully in their communities, develop new meaning and purpose in their life. That was nowhere to be seen in the mental health system. And, and the values that leaders talked about were segregation, you know, we segregate the folks with severe mental illness, professional authority, professionals knew best, and control. How do we control people with severe mental illnesses? 
So we have a system, we have to recognize that we had a system that was set up almost the exact opposite of recovery. So when we're talking about, oh, this is now our new vision, then we have to talk about completely transforming the system, the program, the unit, the residence, wherever you happen to be working. A couple other background points. What do we know about leadership in the public mental health sector? Not very much, very little. You know, we really know very little, especially relative to leadership in the for-profit sector. I mean, how many times have we, how many books have leaders in the for-profit sector uh, written? And, and are, how many times are they credited with, quote, turning the organization around, all right? Or rewarded with astronomical salaries. Uh, and when an organization does well in the for-profit sector, it's always credited, it seems to me, uh, to the leader, all right? Contrast that with the public mental health sector, which I think hasn't had much talk about leadership, but I think leadership is much more difficult in the public mental health sector. It's more complicated, uh, it's, it's, and it's more needed. And I say, that, I say that for good reason. I think inherently more difficult because it's not just shareholders that the leaders in the public mental health sector have to worry about. It's also uh, taxpayers, the general public. We have a myriad of people with oversight responsibilities. We have the courts, you know, we have advocates. Uh, we have the general public, of course. Uh, we have citizen boards. Uh, so the public mental health leader has a lot to contend with, I, would, I believe. They have competing pressures, and just look at some of the pressures today. Uh, we have pressure for quality services in an era of cost cutting. You know, make the services better, but you're gonna do it with less money. Uh, we have consumer choice as an overriding value, yet you still hear talk and laws about outpatient commitment. How do, you, how do you handle those competing pressures? But most of all, we have the status quo versus change. Uh, always, a, always a competing pressure. A couple other points, levels of leadership. I'm talking here about any leader. I'm not talking, when I talk about public mental health sector leadership, I'm not talking about the CEO all the time. I'm talking about leaders of organizations, of uh, self-help groups, of residences, of you could be leader on a ward or in a unit. Uh, we're talking about leadership at all levels. So I guess we ought to define leadership. Uh, and I, I put a couple definitions here kind of in, in, in sequence. Uh, Packard in 1962 said, leadership was the art of getting others to want to do something you're, you are convinced should be done. Sounds a little manipulative uh, to me, but uh, I call that the Tom Sawyer uh, leadership, I think. Um, Wills, Wills kind of took that and went a little, a little bit further. In 1994, he said, the leader is one who mobilizes others towards a goal shared by leaders and followers. So Wills introduced the concept of followers, shared goals, all right? And then Nanus, I think it's N-A-N-U-S, uh, in the 90s also talked about the organizational element that a leader works in an organization with identifiable boundaries and resources. So when we talk here about public mental health leadership, we're talking about a leader who uh, mobilizes others in a particular organization towards a goal or goals shared by the leaders and the followers. That's kind of the definition I'm working off of, of here. You know, you can also define leaders by, by what they aren't. Um, and Nanus and Bennis, particularly, always contrasted leaders with managers. And they did it very artfully, uh, but they also did it somewhat pejoratively towards managers, I think. And you'll hear that as I, as I give you the distinctions they make between leaders and managers. We don't look at managers pejoratively. That's where most of our leaders come from. And many, in many small organizations, leaders are managers as well. But Here's how they kind of tried to make the distinction. I think, I think it's an interesting one, uh, if, as, as I say, somewhat negative towards managers. Uh, they say managers ad administer, leaders innovate. Managers are copies, leaders are originals. Managers focus on systems and structures, leaders focus on people. 
Managers rely on control. Leaders inspire trust. Managers have short-range views. Leaders have long-range perspectives. Managers ask how and when. Leaders ask what and why. And this is one you kind of hear uh, this one uh, in, other, in other places. Managers have their eyes on the bottom line. Leaders have their eyes on the horizon. Managers imitate. Leaders originate. Uh, managers accept the status quo. Leaders challenge it. Managers are classic good soldiers. Leaders are their own people. And lastly, this is another one you kind of hear on occasion. Managers do things right. Leaders do the right thing. Uh, so as you can see, it's not very nice about managers. Uh, but I think you get the idea, if we focus on just the leadership end of it, what leaders are trying to do. And managers certainly uh, are, are uh, able to do those things as well. Uh, one other, uh, a couple other background issues. One is, can leadership be taught? Well, if it can't, we probably could go home now and shut off the camera and so forth. Because <laughs> obviously I'm here uh, presenting today with the belief that leadership can be taught. Uh, how do leaders particularly, how do leaders often learn? Well, one is trial and error. You know, you're, you're thrust into a leadership position and you learn by trial and error. Unfortunately, the leader's errors are often the other people's trials. Uh, it's not a great way to learn, but that's often how we learn to be leaders. Uh, also, you can observe other leaders. If you have the opportunity to observe other leaders in your organization, try and learn from them. Hopefully, they're effective leaders, because if they aren't, you're not going to learn too much. Uh, and lastly, you can learn as a leader through what we're trying to do here today, and that's through education, through training. You can learn from leaders' comments, what they're saying, what they say worked for them. Uh, for, and you can also learn from one another, leaders in a particular system. You can read, reflect, and discuss on people's leadership styles. All right. What we're going to do today is we're going to learn from leaders' comments in our public mental health system. And hopefully, you'll have a chance to reflect and discuss either um, amongst yourselves afterwards uh, uh, and carry, carry this forward. But I'm going to give these principles and, and these tasks so that you can reflect and discuss on them, or discuss uh, more. So I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about eight principles, <coughs> excuse me, and the accompanying tasks that go with those eight principles. And I want to tell you the origin of where we come up with these eight principles. Uh, they're, not just, they're not out of my head, believe me. Uh, so since 1993, I've had the chance to observe leaders. All right. Purposely try and watch leaders, what they're doing, what, what principles, actions, et cetera, they're, they're, they're using. Also, I was reading the literature in the for-profit sector, which I told you. Um, and then I selected leaders to interview. All right. I selected leaders to interview and tape, tape their interviews. I did this based on what followers were saying about them, what their bosses were saying about them, what their peers were saying about them, in terms of their own ability to transform a system. All right. Were they effectively trying to transform their particular organization? Then I identified about 10 principles, and I sent these principles to these leaders and said, I want you to comment on these principles, comment on several principles which you think are most important. I want you to then add some principles and give some examples of how your leadership was guided by these principles. All right, and I taped those interviews. And, and then listen to the tapes and, and not transcribe them, but certainly uh, pick out the p major points that uh, leaders are making in some of their quotes and examples. Uh, right now, I've settled on eight principles based on their comments. Uh, we eliminated some, uh, added some others, et cetera. But based on the comments so far, and I say so far because we're continuing this effort, so far we have eight principles and, and accompanying tasks as delineated by public mental health leaders. And we're going to focus on those eight principles now. The goal being just to familiarize yourself with some of these principles and tasks, all right, so that you can later discuss or comment on them. And the strategy is to overview each principle and talk about a particular leader and how they were guided uh, by some of these principles and some of the tasks that they talked about uh, in the interviews. Now, one thing I... I um, 
I have to do when I talk about these leaders is and how they're examples of these particular principles. If they, I have to stick closely to my notes because I said to them, in order to get them to go on tape and talk about their leadership and examples and so, et cetera, I said obviously I would use their names, but I wouldn't misrepresent them and I wouldn't misquote them. All right, and uh, because this is on tape, I want to make sure I don't do that. So I'm going to stick closely to some of these, uh, uh, um, some of my notes, which, which have quotes in them and certainly describe the system or their setting as they described it. All right. And for principle one, let's start with principle one. Leaders communicate a shared vision. All right, leaders communicate a shared vision. I have a couple, almost all the leaders I interviewed talked about this particular principle. And I'm going to just pull out a couple of them to, uh, to give as, as examples. All right. First one I want to give is Len Stein. Now many of you in the, in the mental health field are aware of, of Len Stein. Uh, he's an excellent example of, the transformation, of this transformational leadership principle. Dr. Stein is considered by many to be the father of community treatment. Um, he and his colleagues originated, are, are really best known for creating, originating, researching, et cetera, what has come to be known as the ACT program, the ACT program in mental health, which is being replicated uh, certainly all across the country, probably across the world. I think less well, well known is, is uh, Len's breadth and passion about the particular vision that guided him. Uh, and what guided him is, is that he thought, he was convinced back in the late 70s, I believe it was, that treating people with severe mental illnesses in the community could not only bypass the side effects of institutionalization, but could open up opportunities for learning and personal growth that a hospital setting could not provide. provide. And what Len did and his colleagues was they took a whole hospital ward, moved all the staff and all the patients out into the community and treated people with very severe mental illnesses in the community and the, the, uh, they were not then referred to the hospital ward, they were referred to when they needed hospitalization, they were referred to this kind of hospital without walls in the community. As Len said at the time, if there was any if there would have been any untoward uh, events happening, such as a suicide or a homicide or whatever, uh, certainly the program would have closed and maybe Len's reputation would have been uh, closed out too. Uh, fortunately, that didn't happen uh, and, and this program has gone on uh, to be replicated in a number of places. I want to give you an anecdote, an example of, uh, that indicates how passionately Len believed in this vision of treating people in the community. Once people began receiving services in the community, and this is where I want to stick close to my notes here. Once people began receiving services in the community, Len maintained that they must be able to contact their providers quickly. Remember, the providers were now in the community too. They were not on the hospital wards. Uh, accordingly, he asked all the therapists to make their phone numbers available to people now living in the community. These would be your home phone numbers. Uh, their refusal, they said no, uh, resulted in, in Len giving the therapists a choice. Either turn in their phone numbers or turn in their resignation. That is a choice when you think about it. Um, I think this anecdote is an indication of how strongly a vision, the vision of community treatment at that time, can guide one's actions and was a key moment in the, in the transformational process for, uh, for Len. If you look at the uh, the, act, the, the uh, actions or tasks under this eight principles of leadership in your handout, I would say that Len certainly in the second one, I should have numbered these, they have bullets. Uh, the leader constantly communicates the vision. In, in, in Len's talk, the points he was making as, as we continued the, the talk and the tape, he was making the point that the leader is able to persuade others of the potency of the vision and you can see he used some uh, strong ways to persuade others, uh, including losing your job, which is a fairly strong way to get you lined up. And the leader uses the vision to shape the future. These were things that came out of, of uh, our discussion with, with Len and which added to, these, uh, added to these principles. I'm going to do some more on this, uh, on this particular principle. 
I want to talk about Kim Ingram. When I interviewed Kim, uh, she was the director of the Thomas Fiddle Mental Health Rehabilitation Center, a fancy name for the state hospital uh, in Thomasville, Alabama. The organization had recently converted their program into a rehabilitation type of hospital and was first accredited by the Joint Commission finally, four years before I interviewed her. And then the year before I interviewed her, uh, she said they were accredited with commendation. Uh, they had improved their yearly discharges over a four year period from 54 to 105 to 150 to 171, respectively. Uh, when I visited, there was a lot of exciting things uh, going on at Thomasville. But Kim talked about some of these principles and particularly she, she mentioned a number of them, also principle one. She used her vision to shape the programs they were creating and eliminating. The vision guided what the institution wanted to become. Initially, when she and a group spent time articulating the values and vision of the organization, Kim did not think it would be particularly useful. As she says, quote, I have been proven wrong on a daily basis. Now she thinks defining the vision and values is one of the most critical things all right, that staff can do. She says, quote, this guides everything that we have done, it allows us to make decisions, everything we do from buying equipment to hiring staff to programming is made relevant to the vision and the, and the mission. When we are making decisions, we ask constantly, quote, is this a key thing that moves us toward accomplishing the vision and mission? They have to live the vision, according to Kim. Uh, she uses the vision to check to see if their actions are aligned with the vision. Uh, quote, she cannot say one thing and do something differently, unquote. As they were transitioning from what she called a tightly controlled, highly structured custodial type of organization, that would be one in the 20th century without uh, any recovery vision, to a rehabilitation focused organization, they struggled with the way in their old lexicon to control patients. All right. For example, she gave us an example. She said they had a levels program, all right, a levels program, which essentially is a program where patients would get privileges based on their behavior. Staff would define what behavior they wanted, patients would perform that good behavior, and they would get privileges. Increasing pr privileges, the better their behavior. She realized that this was a staff vision and not the vision of the service recipients. It was inconsistent with the notion of self-determination and the levels program was ended. Uh, and this was a program that they felt very good about at one time, uh, the levels program lined it up with the vision and said, it's not working, you know, it's not relevant to the vision. Uh, Kim, in terms, of the, in terms of this principle, this principle one, I think, you know, the vision of the leader is shared, the first, the first task. She certainly had meetings, much as she didn't like them initially. Uh, and, and about halfway down where it says, the leader identifies the relevance, relevance of the vision to the organization's consumers. She made sure she involved the uh, uh, consumers in the particular vision. I'll do one more on principle one, uh, and that is uh, Cindy Barker, Cynthia Barker. Cynthia Barker was recovering from mental illness, uh, uh, the symptoms of mental illness, while she continued to work and advocate for the services for people with severe mental illnesses. Uh, when Cynthia was interviewed, she directed Project Phoenix, what she calls a mobile drop-in center, quote, mobile drop-in center, which takes people by van to whatever events and locations in the community to which they wish to go. Services about 100 people a month. Uh, this project has a van and others use their own transportation resources to attend these community activities. And this was what Cin Cynthia was very concerned about. There is no drop-in center per se. They drop in on the community, all right, on any community activities which they choose to go to. You don't go to a drop-in center. Uh, it was one of the first mobile drop-in centers that I ever saw. Matter of fact, when I was there, uh, that morning, Cynthia said, well, why didn't, I wasn't at her center, but I was at, in the area. She said, why don't you come out for lunch with us? And I said, okay. Uh, so I went to a restaurant and we had lunch and there was 30 consumers there dropping in, 
you know, at the, at the, uh, at the restaurant. So that's how they were so efficient in, in doing this. Um, but her, her vision of to use community act activities and settings in a normal way as possible. And an example she gave me is that, is that she was, um, repeat, she repeatedly reminded folks that the program's van, had one van and everybody else used their cars, the van must look like a passenger van and not an agency van. She refused to use the mental health center's 15 person white passenger vans, probably with a writing on the side. Instead, the grant she wrote was to fund a seven passenger you know, minivan, uh, which she made sure was painted burgundy. All right, that was important, she kept mentioning that. Uh, she was vigilant in ensuring the potency of the vision and not letting the program slip into segregated activities or look in a segregated way. So the minivan would pull up, people would get out just like a family. And she leads a life compatible with that vision. She decided to give up her, uh, her disability check. Uh, but if we, look at the eight, if we look at the first principle of leadership, I think you could say, Cindy, on the second point, the leader constantly communicates the vision over and over. She kept saying, we're not going to become, you know, we're not going to end up looking like uh, a group of uh, psychiatric patients uh, getting, going to one place in the, in the dry, as a drop-in center. We're going to use the community. Uh, the second, the next point, the leader clearly communicates the vision. She certainly did that. And down near the bottom, the leader lives a life compatible with the vision. Uh, she certainly did that as well. So there's some examples of leaders who are trying to live by this particular principle and pick this principle out. Remember, I gave them just these principles. I didn't give them any of these accompanying tasks. They just got the principle and were asked to comment on it if it made sense to them. A number of leaders uh, commented on that first, uh, on that first principle. Uh, let's turn to the second principle. Leaders centralized by missions and decentralized by operations. The person I want to use as the example here is Richard Searles. Uh, and he was perhaps one of the most visible uh, city and state mental health directors during the late 1970s all the way through the early 1990s. I interviewed Richard just after he had left his position as commissioner of mental health in the state of New York. Prior to that time, he had directed mental health services in Vermont and Philadelphia. In each setting, he brought direction and energy to a mental health organization. When Richard came in as your new commissioner or director and you were in the organization, you knew it. Uh, things were about to change. Well, he talked again about a number of principles. I want to use him as an example of principle two, leaders centralized by mission and decentralized by operations. Uh, Richard's take on principle two uh, when he talked about how he used that included giving responsibility to operational staff to try new initiatives, all right? And his direction to them was this, and this is a quote, I'll support you as long as you are right. That was an interesting kind of quote, but as he, as he described it, what he was saying was, I'm not gonna tell you exactly what to do. I'm not gonna tell you exactly what to do. Uh, but it has to be con consistent with the mission. All right, that's what right meant. I mean, it's a very simple description of what right was, make it consistent with the mission. Uh, so people had a lot of flexibility to do certain things uh, as long as they were consistent with the mission. And as he said, this paralyzed some people. This paralyzed some people because they were used to having a little more detail. Uh, and some wanted to be told exactly how to do it. But this was the way he tried to run his particular organization. And if you look at the... Uh, uh, principle two, some of the tasks under there. Uh, the first one, the leader uses the mission to focus the entire organization on how the organization can benefit its consumers. That was the focus. He constantly talked uh, about the mission and focused the, the leadership on it. Uh, skipping down uh, one, the leader gives responsibility and authority to the operational staff. He did it, some of them didn't like it, uh, but apparently the majority of them did. Next one, the leader encourages staff to process relevant information themselves. All right, they get the information, they know the mission, they do the operation. The leader manages, skipping down a couple, 
Uh, Lillier manages at a more macro than micro level. It certainly wasn't micromanagement. Uh, and some people maybe do better in that. Uh, the effective leaders I talk to seem to be managing more at a macro level uh, than certainly a micro level. And the second from the bottom, the leader ensures that staff understand that all operational outcomes are critical to the organization's mission. Everyone in the organization, uh, in the operation, their particular operation knew that it had to line up uh, with the mission. Principle three, Leaders create an organizational culture that identifies and tries to live by key values. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go back to Kim. Um, I have so, <laughs> so much material here. I'm going to go back to Kim Ingram because I, I don't have to repeat the, uh, uh, her background again. Uh, but Kim stated that they were, Kim was the director of the uh, Thomasville State Hospital. Kim said that they were guided by three key values uh, for both residents and staff. These values were choice, empowerment, and feeling successful and satisfied. Those were their key values around which everything revolved. As these values were put forward, some staff left uh, who were in disagreement with the values. Choices had been a very difficult value to implement in an inpatient facility, but nevertheless, it did anchor their decision making getting all staff to believe that people were capable of choices and decisions for themselves was very difficult. Kim told a story of a, of a voluntary patient uh, who wanted to leave on foot on a Sunday to hitchhike to Mobile and then on to Georgia. Uh, Kim called in the clinical director to speak with the patient, but of course the patient was a voluntary patient, doing quite well. Um, and he was judged not to meet the criteria for, uh, for involuntary commitment. So consistent with his self-determination value, the patient was not prevented from leaving. They talked to him about not leaving, waiting till Monday. Uh, they talked to him about getting some help from them in terms of what help they might need, but the patient didn't want any of that. Uh, he left and he returned on the same day. All right? uh, and Kim stated that, that he is now working even harder on his rehabilitation plans and his eventual recovery. And she quotes the patient as saying, I made a bad choice. All right? But he made a choice. All right? He made a choice. Uh, and they lived with that particular value. If you look at some of the things Kim, Kim did most, uh, uh, some of the tasks that Kim talked about related to that value, the leader is clear about what values influence organizational decision making. Next one, the leader uses the organization's values as anchors and guidelines for decisions. Uh, skip down one. The leader acknowledges when organizational values conflict. Uh, you know, that uh, certainly the self-determination and choice sometimes conflicts with other values. Uh, the leader ensures that the organization's values are the same for everyone in the organization, regardless of role. Patient, staff, uh, makes no difference. Okay, principle four. Leaders create an organizational cult structure and culture that empowers their employees. Um, Bob Williams, uh, let me get Bob here. Bob Williams is a good example of this. Um, some of you I know are listening on the, uh, on the web right now know Bob. Bob was interviewed when he was superintendent of Florida State Hospital. He and his staff had instituted a person-centered treatment and rehabilitation program. Uh, quote, to enable persons who are experiencing a severe and persistent mental illness to manage their symptoms and acquire and use the skills and supports necessary to return to the community and be successful and satisfied in the environment of their choice. That was their vision. Uh, with respect to uh, principle four, uh, Bob said uh, that he saw, ass he saw staff as assets all right, he, rather than, and really as a resource to empower. When he arrived, he developed a list of about 50 people within the organization that had significant leadership potential, but were not typically in leadership positions at that time. Bob went to this list when positions opened up, quote, we didn't get too hung up on credentials, unquote. In essence, he looked for certain characteristics in people, such as their ability to, re to relate to residents as individuals, 
a willingness to work hard, and a desire to lead. He mentions again, quote, their degree was one of the least important criteria. It was this group in which Bob invested all his training resources. He told them, quote, I told them up front that they were the critical ingredients if the program was going to be successful. They were there to be the change agent. They had my personal support. He estimated at least three quarters of them did very well. If you look at principle four, in terms of some of the things Bob mentioned to me, the leader sees staff as investments and assets rather than simply costs. Next one, the leader delegates power and authority to employees. Skipping down a couple, the leader recognizes staff who act in an empowered way. Next one, the leader encourages staff to develop their own opportunities to stretch. And the next one, the leader eliminates organizational traditions that hinder empowerment. Of course, he mentioned several times over credentials, uh, and he eliminated them as an as a, uh, impediment to, uh, to getting in uh, to particular leadership positions. All right, five, six, seven, and eight. Five, leaders believe that a human technology can translate vision into reality. By human technology, I mean the techniques and strategies that science has shown that help people to change. That's really human technology. What techniques and strategies help people to change? Uh, Dennis Rice uh, in Massachusetts, uh, director of Alternatives Unlimited, was a great example of this. He ran a residential educational and vocational program for people with serious mental illnesses and uh, also people with mental retardation. Um, Dennis was one of the leaders who was most serious about training people in what we call a human technology. They were struggling early on. They had uh, milieu therapy and uh, that type of intervention, group interventions, and, and this was not working according to Dennis. So they, they committed themselves to training people in skills and strategies and techniques. Not knowledge, but in skills, strategies, and techniques. He hired three full-time trainers, All right, three full-time trainers, which most organizations his size don't have. And then he felt he could take any innovation that came down the pike and train people in it because they knew how to train, they knew how to translate these innovative concepts uh, into skills. Um, he says, we integrated and reprioritized so many things and training opportunities for staff and service recipients. Staff meetings became study groups. House meetings uh, could include skill teaching. Uh, Dennis um, certainly had uh, created an organizational culture that recognized the value of the human technology. Uh, he believed that staff training must focus on skills as well as facts and concepts. Uh, and he ensured that the organization's training plan was linked to the organization's mission. So often leaders have this training plan out here and this mission over here, but they don't relate. You're just training people in things that you find interesting, but really don't relate to the mission. Uh, here's a good example of principle five. In the interest of time, I'm going to use him for principle six, uh, so I don't have to describe Dennis again. Uh, principle six, leaders re relate constructively to employees. Uh, Dennis believed you couldn't communicate enough. Um, and listening to people about their issues was a critical part of communication. Interesting quote here, uh, he says, the leader communicates, communicates, communicates. You can't communicate enough. And frankly, I find this very annoying. Uh, the patience one has to have to communicate the vision, values, mission is a full-time job even though the leader has other things to do. Um, he, he mentioned that the leader is constantly communicating this big picture, and you know, the staff are into the detail, the nitty gritty, so that somehow he had to constantly connect the, the nitty gritty uh, to, the bigger, to the bigger picture. Uh, he says, we believe that the quality of an organization is reflected in the importance it places in all its members, and this includes staff. We need staff to be successful, if the clients are going to be successful. All right, we're all the way up to principle seven. Uh, and, and you are bearing with me well, at least the people in the room. Uh, principle seven, leaders access and use information to make change a constant ingredient of their organization. And uh, Pam Womack uh, 
is a great example of that. Uh, visited Pam's agency. She was interviewed uh, when she was executive director of the Mental Health Cooperative, which was a case management agency in Nashville, Tennessee. At that time, the agency provided case management, clinic services, and crisis intervention services. There's 840 people using case management, of which over 1,300 used the clinic services. The crisis intervention services was a mobile crisis service, and that was used by everybody in the entire county. Um, I have over 170 staff, 70 case managers, five physicians, five nurses, et cetera, et cetera. Principle seven, Pam picked principle seven as one of the principles that made the most sense to her. And she said the old adage that when you are through changing, you are through, applies to her. All right? Pam sees information as the organization's capital that makes the change more effective. The organization data comes from what people say is needed or descriptions of data that the agency collects. So she sees data as coming from the consumer or coming from their, uh, their database. They have key monitors uh, uh, that they monitor weekly. For example, they look at how many minutes a case manager is in face-to-face -face contact with consumers. Uh, they look at hospitalization rates, where they're living, medications they're taking, et cetera. They collect and collect information in this particular agency. And then they make changes based on it. They change the team. They find that some teams have too many difficult clients, so they change that. They found another team that was underperforming in terms of the 40 minute, in terms of the face-to-face -face time. Uh, and they found that uh, they needed to be use their computers in a, in a better way. Another example of, uh, from Pam uh, is they had a, 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 resp a crisis program and they found that people were not using the, uh, uh, the crisis program. Uh, they didn't want to go to the hospital. Uh, they didn't, they, I'm sorry, they weren't using the uh, uh, hospital uh, if they could avoid it, and they didn't like the emergency service uh, when they talked to consumers. And also, the data they were collecting showed that when people went in the hospital, they were just there for two days. So they didn't seem like they really needed the hospital. So what they did was they developed a respite program using local hotels. Uh, and they would get a hotel room, and the person would stay in that hotel room during the time of crisis with a consumer who would provide support and assistance. Um, they're, as Pam puts it, they're constantly looking uh, for new ways to do things. She says, our whole goal is to remove any barrier that a consumer has to getting services here or to live their life. Is, is this a barrier or a help, we ask? We just start lopping off the barriers. All right. The last, uh, the last principle, uh, and I just mentioned here in terms of before I do that, that uh, uh, Pam, you know, loses leaders. She used the information to frame problems in new and unique ways. All right. It wasn't how do we get them to use the hospital better, but let's come up with a new program. Let's frame the program as a need of the clients, not a need of the hospital. The leader sees information as the organization's capital. Looking down here, the leader uses information to anticipate the future. Uh, the leader thrives on change. Nobody does that more than Pam. She initiates change rather than manages change. She recognizes that maintaining the status quo actually is moving the organization backwards. Uh, she recognizes that when you're doing things well, it's time to do more things. Uh, and at the bottom, the leader knows that while planning for change is good, Allegiance to plans may not always be appropriate. There's constantly changing her plans. All right, the last principle, and we'll close here. Um, in the interest of time, let me use somebody that I've already used. Let me use Bob Williams here. Uh, leaders build their organization around exemplary performers, um, particularly around uh, the last comment here. The pu leader publicly recognizes the outstanding contributions of exemplars to the organization. Bob identified a number of exemplars. I'm not going to give those examples in the interest of time. But he had a culture that recognized people's uh, accomplishments and appreciated them so. Uh, when you walk down the hall with Bob, you know, oh, here's Joe, such and such. He's developed such and such, doing a great job. I mean, he's just constant. I was at a, uh, a dinner with him, and uh, he brought in the catering staff for a round of applause. He had them all come in for a round of applause. He just constantly was building exemplars as well as recognizing exemplars. Okay, 
I've gone through the eight principles. Uh, just a summary reflection for me uh, on, on these principles as they're developing is that all the people I've interviewed for so far differ greatly. Now, obviously, they differ in gender, in credentials, in age, things like that. But they also differ in personality. They differ in, differ in terms of how charismatic they are. Some are, some aren't. Uh, I really left feeling charisma wasn't the issue here. Uh, but they were similar in their commit to, commitment to certain principles of leadership, what I call a developing science of leadership. Uh, and I'll just conclude with a caveat here, uh, and this is that, uh, quote, quoting myself, leadership remains an art as well as a science. Some of the tools of leadership are not simply the tools of science. Some are the tools of the self. All right. Okay, I thank you very much, and we can open it up for questions, right? If anybody has any questions in the, in the audience, you people uh, obviously listening to the archival presentation aren't going to have much of an opportunity. All right, we'll try a couple questions. Uh, the one thing I'm wondering about is when change did not go well. Um, it sounds as though change is something that we definitely want to strive for. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't always go well. And I'm wondering if any of the leaders that you spoke to changed or learned from a change that did not go the way they hoped it would. Yeah. I think Pam gave a number. Pam Womack, who was in the case management uh, organization in Tennessee, gave a number of examples of when she tried, and she was always changing. When she tried something, uh, it didn't seem to work. And she would go back quickly because they, they were collecting data. I think the key is they're getting data from their collection system as well as from the consumers because they're very tied into the participants. And as soon as they saw it wasn't working, they went back to the drawing board and tried to come up with something else. But it's a good point. There are a number of times when your plans just don't work and allegiance to plans uh, is not a good thing if you're about change. Another comment? Um, there's a school of thought that suggests that people, leaders who stay in a position for more than three years become still and ineffective. What's your response to that? I don't think so. I think, you know, if leaders are growing, you know, and they're trying new things and they're building new programs, uh, some leaders do the same thing over and over again. These were not the leaders that I were recommended to me. They were really the leaders who were trying to transform their organization. So it wasn't like they were continually just managing or leading uh, Group X or Program Y, and that was it. I think maybe the key again there was the change and the transformation and the effort at constantly trying to, trying to build a better, a new and better organization, and not just uh, living with the status quo. In other words, nobody said, gee, we got a great organization. We're trying to just keep it right there where it's going. It was always. What, can, what more can we do? Another comment? Last comment. Do you think that there's much of a difference between the kind of leaders in an organization depending on where that organization is at? For example, a, a new fledgling program being started or a new organization versus one that sounds like a lot of your focus has been on transformation and change. Um, any comments on yeah, that? That's, that's interesting. I did, and I wasn't able to give the uh, examples. I did do a lot of organizations that were just brand new and developing. I did do leaders from those organizations. And the principles seemed to be the change, same. I mean, they, they picked from the list of 10 or 12, whatever number of principles I had at the time, and didn't seem to have any trouble. And they, they didn't seem to be different than the, than the leaders who like one leader I didn't talk about who I've interviewed with Mike Hogan, who came into a uh, situation in Ohio where the vision was kind of already there. The organization was there. They were going along a different, uh, a certain path that was very transformational. And it was up to him to maintain it. Uh, yet the, uh, uh, many of the same principles and tasks were the same. I think I'm getting the, the sign that the, uh, uh, the comment period is over. I just want to thank you folks for one, the folks that came, one, the folks that are watching live, and, and lastly, the folks that are watching uh, the archive of this webcast. Uh, good luck in your leadership. 
uh, it is an exciting area to study and think about and discuss and reflect upon. Uh, we certainly need uh, better leaders in this century because the system we have right now needs to be totally transformed. So thank you very much.